Fiona for sharing my secrets, my <laughs> deepest secrets. The fashion industry is lucky that I haven't unleashed my dubious creativity onto <laughs> it to date. Um, purpose and proof. This is something that, as um, Fiona said, I feel really passionate about. And to me, purpose is nothing if you're not an organisation that actually lives it. Too often there's words stuck on a wall and no action that sits behind it. So I'd like to see a show of hands for the people that work in organisations that are here today that actually live their purpose. Fantastic. You guys are in the minority. I think it would be fair to say that just about every organisation has a purpose, but less than half of them actually live it. And that is a real shame, because as a world, do I, am I progressing? Okay, great. Should I be seeing it down here? Okay, no. <laughs> As a world, capitalism has wreaked havoc across lots of areas of our lives and it's come at a great cost. And for me, working with organisations, I still see an almost myopic obsession with short-term quarterly earnings at the expense of the long-term benefits that business has to offer organisations. And it's also interesting that this is not a new thing. 40 years ago, Body Shop started. You know, I found that astonishing. And at the time, they were considered to be somebody who was way out there in terms of their view of the world. Today, it would be fair to say that this is mainstream. And there is much to do. On the radio on the weekend, I heard an interesting stat. And it was from an economist who said that the economic cost of poverty in New Zealand, of child poverty in New Zealand, is equal to the economic contribution that Fonterra makes and I did find that ironic. <laughs> so business has a lot to answer for and actually business is having to now deal with the problems that they've created because resource scarcity makes it difficult for organisations to survive. But there's so much hope for those of us who want to put forward a business case to say actually this is a better way of doing things. And there's a lot of research that's been done around the world looking at the difference between purpose-led and profit-led organisations, and what the quantum of performance is between those. And these are not small numbers. These are massive differences in growth rates and profitability and revenues, proven again and again in different types of studies over long periods of time. So it's a long-term view of what does purpose do to a business's performance. It multiplies your profit. And it's not an either-or situation. Profit and purpose can and do go hand in hand. And it doesn't just stop at the financial metrics. Coma Brunton has also done a study called the Reputation Index. And we found that 40% of an organisation's reputation capital comes from something called trust. And what drives trust? Ethics and responsibility. So being an ethical company and acting in a responsible way. And what does trust drive? Trust drives advocacy, probably one of the most precious commodities in a world where empowered consumers spread the word at the push of a button every day. So when they're doing that, we want them to be speaking positively about us. And who's speaking positively about Apple today? You know, pinged for $20 billion in profit and taxes that they didn't pay to Ireland. You know, it's scary, some of the things that have been happening. So if you want raving fans, start thinking about purpose. And not only that, purpose drives the heart and minds, as Kate said, of the people that work inside your organisation. And the impact of purpose on culture is significant, and we're only just starting to wake up to what that means for organisations. Your employees in purpose-driven or values-driven organisations are more than three times as likely to stay. They're twice as happy and they're much more energised when they're there. And you can just think about the impact that that has on productivity and results. In the background there is the cover of an album by Justin Bieber called Purpose, which tells me that purpose is now part of pop culture. <laughs> I'm not a big fan, but... Um, 
my eight-year-old daughter is. <laughs> and I guess probably the thing that fills me with the most hope is what sometime are called the canaries in the coal mine, and this is a new generation called Generation Y, roughly 18 to 35 years old, and another generation coming up behind them called Z. These two generations are globally recognised to be the most environmentally and socially responsible ever. And I've got a quote there from a 15-year-old boy because I thought it was just gorgeous. Every generation is going to leave problems, but if we can find a way to fix the ones we have now, we can focus on making the world better. Fantastic. I saw a, a programme last night, Nigel Latter, um, and he featured a young girl who was the victim of cyberbullying. And she and her cohort have got together and they've developed a whole training programme with these amazing resources and they're going into their school and training all the other kids about how to deal with cyberbullying. I thought, how wonderful this new generation is. They just get an idea and they innovate and they make it happen. It's fantastic. More than half of this generation have ruled out working for an organisation that doesn't fit their values. And I've personally experienced this myself at Colmar Brunton, where graduates have come to work for us because they felt our values fitted theirs. Nine in 10 believe that your success must be measured by more than financial performance, and this is a really big deal because the millennials now are bigger than the baby boomer generation and they're accountable for 41 trillion in transferred wealth. It really matters what they think, not just as employees, but also as consumers. And the emergence of this generation post-recession is creating a whole new view of the way that organisations and businesses need to behave. Underpinning it, I believe, is basically a value shift from consumption to conservation, from individuality to a more socially conscious view of the world. And this new generation are spawning a whole range of wonderful new businesses. Rachel talked about it earlier. If you're lucky enough to be a judge in the SBN Awards, it is astonishing the wonderful innovation and the progressive, socially progressive businesses that young people are starting up in New Zealand and around the world. B Corp estimates this group of businesses to now be at least 30,000 strong and delivering 40 billion in revenues. These are fast growing, profitable businesses. From a consumer point of view, it also matters. 31% of New Zealanders are telling us they'll buy more sustainable in the next year. So there's strong growth within this sector and that's grown 10% amongst Gen Y in the last year. 64% will pay more. They understand there's a value proposition here that requires investment. Six in 10 on average consider sustainability across all kinds of categories and the decisions that they make for the products and services that they buy. And 74% want to work for a company that takes this stuff seriously and lives its purpose. Along with that comes a great deal more questioning, and we are seeing that the blanket trust that has been given to products and services that we buy, consumer goods that we're buying in the supermarkets is starting to decline, and it is declining fastest amongst millennials. Their level of trust in the safety of the products they buy in the supermarket dropped 10% in the last year. While it's still high, there is an indication that they're starting to think a whole lot more about, is this a product that's good for me, and is it good for my family? And that means as organisations delivering products and services, we need to think really carefully about how we communicate what we're doing to address some of these concerns. So with all this interest, there must be lots of consumers looking for brands and wanting to understand who are the leaders while they're not seeing them. They're not obvious to them. Seven in 10 tell us that they can't name anyone who's a leader in sustainability. And this number hasn't really changed over time. And I guess I've said for a long time, hang on a minute, they really care about it. It means a lot to them. It has a big impact on what they do. Let's start talking about it. And I'm just going to say it again. Let's take the stuff that we're doing as organisations and businesses and embed it into the brand stories that we're taking out to the market. 
because it's really important that we start leading the conversation, not following it. <coughs> Those that are named as leaders, there tend to be a common group across the years, some surprises there, but at the end of the day, EcoStore features pretty prominently across the years, as do Meridian, Toyota. In the last few years, organisations like Whitakers and Trade Aid starting to come up more strongly, and I guess that's part of the volume that they're putting around the conversations they're having in this area. So it does make a difference. And there's general consensus that there's a lot more business could do. So don't sit back waiting for permission because consumers want to hear about it, they want to know about what's happening. Inside your business, they want to hear about it, and outside your business, they want to hear about it. They want to see new products and services. They want to see recognition for the work that they're doing to help you be more sustainable as businesses. They want education. They want you to change the way you operate. So I'm going to finish up with what I think are three key takeaways for this year in terms of building a sustainable, value-creating business. And the first one is define your meaning and be very clear about what that is. A purpose is not a brand proposition. A purpose is a belief in something that's bigger than you or your category. It's a belief in an impact that you're going to make on the world in a big way. And one of the interesting things about purpose, I believe, is that every organisation starts with a desire to make a big impact on the world, to make a positive difference. And if you're having trouble finding out where your purpose is, it's always a good idea to go right back to the beginning and think about where you started and why you started. If you want to find your why for now. This is a process that we did with a really big organisation and an important organisation in New Zealand called New Zealand Post. 179 years this organisation had been around. And when we went back into their past, we found a whole lot of obstacles that have been put in the way of them actually getting started. If you think about New Zealand 179 years ago, the first postmaster that they cobbled together turned out to be a terrible drunk. So, you know, they had a pretty rocky start. The English came in and tried to take over the whole postal system and they fought them back. They delivered mail in ships that went around this very unhelpful country that was long and skinny with sea all around it. As an organisation over the years, they've constantly reinvented and transformed themselves, and they're in a situation now where they have to do the same. And their people were wanting to know what the why was. They needed the why to help them deal with the how. They needed to understand why things were changing so much. And New Zealand Post's purpose that we came up with is nothing gets in the way of delivering the things that people care about. Some simple words on a page, but I can tell you for that organisation it means everything. And we consulted all the way from the front line to the board to find out what their purpose was, and for all of them this statement has meaning, partly because they created it themselves, but partly because it encompasses all the things that really matter to them as people that are part of that organisation. And everybody can find meaning and impact in this particular statement that helps them understand, okay, what do I do now? And Dawn was telling me the other day that they're using this as a guardrail around their decision. So hang on a minute. Nothing gets in the way. We can't stop now. We've got to keep going. We've got to keep trying. So purpose can be a really important part of helping an organisation deal with transformation. And my tip, always go back to the start. Here's some other wonderful organisations with wonderful purpose statements. And if you went into these businesses, I'm sure that the people that work there would say to you, this really means something to me. This is more than a job for me. This is a crusade. <coughs> the other piece is you've got to start talking about it. There's no point having a wonderful mission or purpose internally without people actually knowing what you're trying to do. 
because it's amazing how people will want to partner and collaborate with you to make it happen. Live it, share it, but always do it from the inside out. Start inside to define your purpose. If you don't create value for your staff, they will leave, and that is more the case now than ever before. Millennials are looking for organisations that fit their values and ethics, and the way that you connect with them is through your purpose. Everybody will know that quote. I love it. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. And as I said earlier, we're just beginning to understand how much of an impact culture has on the success of an organisation. We're only just starting to measure it. It's huge. I've just got some examples here of different organisations that are starting to talk much more purposefully about what they do and addressing front on some of the questions that are being asked about their categories and their businesses from food companies trying to work with parents to say, okay, together we can do better things. Alcohol companies promoting responsible drinking. Um, fast food companies looking into their supply chains to try and do things better. This whole piece starts to open up a whole lot of areas for you to think about how you're a better organisation and how you can build better relationships across all of your stakeholders. And last but not least, it's an evolution. A purpose is not something that sits in concrete. Purpose should evolve because organisations evolve. It should change because organisations change. But I guess one of the things that I see a lot is that purpose is not measured. And if you're going to be making improvement or if you're going to be making progress, you need to measure how well you're doing. So closing the loop is incredibly important. Make sure that you've got some kind of measure around whether or not you're achieving your purpose within the groups that you need to talk to. I'd just like to finish with a couple of things that I think are really inspiring. First of all, this is not a new thing. Purpose ultimately is about giving people a sense of meaning, a sense of impact in what they're doing, and it's particularly important at work that people have that sense of meaning. As an organisation, if you think about, okay, what do we do and what are the needs of our customers, the intersection of those two things is where your purpose will be found. I was reading recently um, about a psychotherapist. His name is Viktor Frankl. He was a Holocaust survivor. And after the Holocaust, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, quite a famous book, really inspiring, and he's built a whole philosophy and practice around this, this issue of meaning and how important it is to individuals. And I think the thing is, if it's important to individuals, it has to be important to businesses. And he gave an example of he was learning to fly, and the flying instructor said to him, well, if you want to go from here to here, and there's a crosswind, you can't just head there, because you're going to end up way down there. You've actually got to start heading up way above in order to get where you want to be. And he uses that as an analogy for us as individuals to think about, okay, what would my ideal self look like? Rather than focusing on what I could do, what about stretching myself a little bit further? And his view is that if we stretch ourselves a little bit further and if we go for something really big, then we will end up finding the real expression of our best self. We won't be underperforming as people or organisations. And I thought that was cool. And he also said, I'll get this right, anyone who has a strong enough why can endure any how. You know, and I think for me personally, that's something that I'm going to be thinking about a lot as I build my own business. You know, what the why makes everything else okay. It helps you decide what are the best decisions to make. It helps you engage people in a way and inspire people in a way that other organisations can't do. And no matter what happens, if you've got the why, everybody's still moving in the same direction towards the same thing. I've missed a pig. I'm glad 